um, drive on the publisher or on the Microsoft side. So for example, this is thread material. This is all thread from like a cotton plant, so this is probably some cotton. Because um, yeah, very irregular. Some of it's flattened. That's just cotton. So this is all this is really good to get you to recognize the difference between what fungi are yeah. and, uh, and cotton. So, so you got now it breaks and now we're over here. So that is <coughs> that's not a strand of fungi. That's how much that's right on the slide. That's that's just thread from uh, thread from something. Because it's all twisted and yeah, used it and clumped up here and different diameters as you go along, one part is thicker, one parts. So I'm you know, just plant material there. So did they run this through a straighter bag or something? Did they run it through cheesecloth or some fabric? Because that's sheer fabric.
So you can just seal it into something to keep it from getting. Yeah, just cover it with something. So you prevent dust from falling on everything. So see, the dust is Look at all those threads. And so that's all threads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, good to know. I'm going to fish a bunch of threads. Yeah. Hey, Chris, maybe the fish ate a bunch of thread. Yeah. Hey, Chris, maybe the fish ate a bunch of thread. And fermented it out. What's in the fish? I guess this is a so nice. That, that looks, looks like a fungus. That looks like a nice little hypha. That's a hypha. This does look like one, yeah. Uh, they can come very long if you don't break them up. Now, um, remember we've been finding a lot of fungus going on our plastic cover slips. And I think that's what this does. Because I'm not really focused on my sample. There's my sample. That's um, yeah. my cover slip. Sure. <laughs> Going. So we've gone through focusing, we've gone through that whole process. 
You've got this in your book, so you should be able to go back through that process if you ever forget. And you're like, oh, what do I need? Just give me a call or Skype or email or something so that um, you can always be confident in what you're doing. So typically, starting with our four excellence, um, you can see quite a bit of your sample. So this is the largest amount of your sample that we're going to be seeing through a single field of our microscope. And so what we're looking at is organic matter. This used to be a plant. So you can see that we've got to have some strands here. And so you're going to have to go up in magnification to figure out, is that fungus, is it just stuff? We've got some more strands, some more strands. That's some interesting round things here. We've got some oblong, glass grainy things. Can't distinguish them yet. But at least you know you're in the right plane of focus. Objective lenses on these microscopes should be parfocal, which means once you focus with one lens, you should be pretty much in focus with all the other lenses. So you don't have to be working really hard. Once you've got focused in at your 4x objective, you should be pretty well in focus for everything else, which is another reason to have your microscope serviced by a microscope um, professional at least once a year to keep that all in alignment. Here we are the 10x objective, or 100x total magnification, right? And so you can see that piece of organic matter. And you can definitely see that these are really slender at the end and they get fatter. So it's just strands of material, plant material that we're looking at. We're seeing that this is not uniform diameter as we go along, so we're not a fungus. Santa grain. We're looking at lots and lots and lots of bacteria, so we would dilute this sample more in order to get up to the point where we can count the number of bacteria in that field pretty easily, and you really probably only want to have it between 30 and 50 bacteria in that field in order to count it. Or if you spend too much time going, what do you think my bicep's going to be in the and you And you could have just done your dilution, put another cup of drops on your next slide, and stuck that out there and gone, yeah, that looks like 30 to me. I'll give that one 40. And 35. See, we don't have to be massively precise here, as long as we're close. Now, strands here, threads, and this is either going to be a real narrow fungal hypha or it's going to be actinum, so we're going to have to go up in magnification to be able to tell that. You can tell what this is, right? Testate amoeba. There's the shell, there's the test, there's the amoeba back in the end. It uh, got really scared when we shook the sample, so it pulled some of this uh, aggregate material into the top of the shell to protect itself. So it's not going to get harmed by whatever terrible thing is shaking this whole entire world. These are ciliate cysts. Ciliate's pretty big guys. When they go dormant, they form a cyst, and they're going to be big cysts like this typically. And they only have one single wall around the outside. As they get a little bit older, the inside of that cyst becomes completely clear. You won't see anything inside that cyst. But they're just recently have gone, ah, the world is hurting. And so they've insisted. So they've not long been dormant. So another test data we Lots of bacteria, lots of little bacteria. So let's go up in magnification one more. So here you can see how small a portion of your field you're actually looking at. So you can see why we kind of have to look at 20 fields to get a really representative idea of what's in the sample. So test the amoeba. There's the amoeba. There's the plug it's brought in. You know, you might think that would be a fungal hypha, nah, too short a piece, does it really count? This is too tattered and frayed and pulled apart, fungi never do that. Same thing with this little piece right here, tattered, frayed, pulled apart. So we've got some good aggregates in this field, 
lots of bacteria, but we're going to count the bacteria to higher dilution. So, what are these interesting critters? Air bubbles. So, when you, especially when you see oily material in the middle, and as you focus on these, they're perfectly circular. And when you focus out, the black edges get thicker and thicker, and the whole thing becomes black like that one. And then when you focus back down, the, the black rim goes apart till it's just a little tiny cell wall. And then it gets black when you go the other way. Air bubble. Not an interesting critter. Invariably, when I teach introductory microbiology class, and we have the first couple of um, sessions in the microbiology lab, and I send the students out to draw some bacteria. I'll have a student or two that spends an entire hour drawing this new organism and no one's ever seen it before, it's never been described. And I walk by and I go, no, I told you to go draw bacteria, not air bubbles. What? What? Yeah, you've got another 45 minutes of work to do. You might want to start now. So, what is this kind? Test amoeba. So we've got a protozoan, right? We have somebody that's going to be doing nutrient cycling. Yay! Good. What's the difference between again between testate amoeba and just an amoeba? Um, we would call these guys testate amoeba. The other guys that don't have tests often get labeled naked amoeba. And you want to get a laugh at a at a seminar? You know, start talking about your naked amoeba. The test is the shell around the outside. Yep, the test is the shell, and it builds that shell itself. And if you can see the little platelets in here. There's, it makes all these little plates, calcium carbonate, um, and so it's a really gorgeous piece of, of artwork, really. Negative media, of course, don't make any um, shells, and so we've seen movies of how those amini move. Haven't seen any amini in any, any naked amini in anybody's samples today. Um, aggregate. This is a bunch of bacteria on the surface of a mineral particle, and it gets really hard to count the bacteria on here. So we want to lift this sample, shave that, and try to get the organisms off the surface of that mineral col uh, colony. Mineral compound and into your solution. So, you know, we're counting and uh, get an idea of how many bacteria are actually in your um, sample. So, what do you think about diversity in here? Is this slide higher diversity or lower diversity than the previous one? Well, look at all the little, the small bacteria. We've got little rods, little rods, we've got Big fat coxi, we've got smaller coxi, we've got shorter little rods, we've got bigger rods. What kind of rods are these? What are we doing in this? Lacrobacillus. So there we have another. We have lots and lots of different species of bacteria. So this is much preferable to that previous sample where pretty much all we have are a bunch of coxi. So I would say on this one, Get some better foods back into your sand, soil or your compost to get that up to where we want it to be. So take a look at that in the corner. What is this? You want to be able to uh, stick your finger on your cover slip and poke it a little bit. See if this moves as the rest of your shampoo moves. And it doesn't. So what is that? Grass. Grass on the slide. Yeah. See all the nice straight lines here? See all those nice straight? So when we were cleaning that slide, there was probably a piece of sand on that slide. And as we wiped it clean, that piece of sand scratched our slide and it's left behind some interesting bits. So, looking at the criteria for bacteria. Rod shape. Round, we can have round rods, coco, bacilli. And we've seen some of those today oh, in these slides. What we haven't really seen are these comma-shaped bacteria. 
Typically, common shaped bacteria are really only found in um, aquatic samples. So if you pulled in some seawater, if you went to some fresh water, and those bacteria really are just like commas, and you're going to get that little tail off the end of that bacteria. So a little dot with a comma on it, so now think about this guy looking, looking through your, your liquid. He's going to have a little bit of unique morphology to him when he's still, and if he's moving, you get that um, moving wave. The sporilla, those are the corkscrew shaped bacteria. And so they are really corkscrews, stiff corkscrews. So as they move, as they're mobile, it sets up that staining wave. And again, these are really bad bacteria. If you see them, exit that sample somehow down the toilet, let the sewage treatment deal with it. Um, put it back into the swamp or you know, go cook it for a while. But you want to be careful with your own, um, your hands and things, whatever that came in contact with, you would really want to clean it up because these bacteria can cause some serious diseases. We don't want to be seeing those. And they only occur in anaerobic or stagnant waters. So, would I? Would I add it in at the beginning of a composting operation? Sure, yeah, not a problem. So as long as you're going to compost and get it up to heat, just be a little careful with yourself when you're turning that compost pile for the first couple turns because have you taken care of all these disease-causing bacteria? So bacteria, just a reminder of the things that bacteria, good guy bacteria can do for you. And so, um, you know, some more pictures. Here is a microarthropod poop. So it's just poop this out. And we have stained this with fluorescein diacetate. So we're looking at the active bacteria. So we got active bacteria on the surface. You can see some other outside where there are a lot of active bacteria in this material. So that's how we determine active bacteria in your samples. We stain with fluorescein diacetate. And then we have a UV lamp that will shine on this so we can see those fluorescent organisms. Notice that the background here has a real reddish color to it. This material, this soil, is from Georgia. It's Georgia red clay. So in the past, this soil has gotten very anaerobic. And as that soil has come back aerobic, all of that reduced iron got oxidized and it gives you this red color. So a lot of times just by looking at the background and some of this, it, it can tell you a lot about the chemistry of that sample. So a colony of bacteria, and you can count the individual bacteria in here, and then start calculating biomass that's in that colony. And so we are measuring length and width on bacteria like this in the lab in Oregon, or or uh, New York or others around the world, mm -hmm. and we convert that into violence of active bacteria. So we then count total bacteria, so we can compare those two. Scanning an electron microscope picture of a compost. Most people think that compost, you know, you go poking around in that pile and you start picking up that compost material. You think of your, you're thinking of and you're picking up plant material, but in fact you're probably not in any way contacting plant material when you pick up compost. When you look at all of this material in this picture, it is strictly and only bacteria, fungi, protozoa that you can see and so that's what you're touching when you're picking up compost is the biology completely covering the surfaces of your plant material. When you look at all this material, there is only this little bit, and it has some rods, it has two little cocci and another rod. That's a little bit of uncovered plant material. This little bit right here, uncovered plant material, but it's got a rod, another rod, another rod, and a little cocci in it. Otherwise, everything else is organisms. So this is a yeast. So we're looking at those anaerobic fungi, 
knees to my arms, I'll pick up a few of them and those come pose. So have a little micro spot. That was anaerobic. We've got some uh, we have a few bacteria sitting on the surface of those yeasts. We've got a bigger, fatter rock pox on. And so when you start looking at all of these things, there's the slime layer that your bacteria produce. There's a rod shaped big bacterium. There's a, the real one. There's that corkscrew shaped microorganism you see them at the top. It's right up there. See that corkscrew shape? Mm, well, just one in the whole sample. Okay. But if you start seeing one, one or two, you really want to just exit the sample altogether. When you go down and you start looking at all the different kinds of bacteria in the sample, the bacteria there and there, there are about 18 species of bacteria. And there's a little bit of compost that's only about 50 microliters by 40 microliters in surface area. Now multiply that by the number of fields of view times the number of species that we're finding each of these fields and well, massive number of species in here. These, these clumps of bacteria, could those be obscuring aggr aggregates? Yeah. Yep. They're basically coating them and holding yeah, them together. Coating that aggregate, so we're probably looking at all kinds of plant material back there that these bacteria are completely covering. So completely in mesh. There's a nice bunch of strands in here, so really a pretty nice diameter because if that's 10 micrometers, this is maybe three and a half. So there's a different species, it's a different diameter. There's another species, different diameter, much narrower. So lots of different species of fungi. Remember this was critical point dried before we coated it with gold palladium. So these organisms have actually shrunk down in size just a little bit. So there is some artifact involved when we're doing um, scanning EM or transmission EM. Fungi then. So would most all of you be comfortable? We go back to this. Would you be comfortable counting the number of bacteria in that field. No. No. Not just because there's too many. But let's say our whole field was like just this size. Would you feel confident to say, yeah, that's a bacterium. There's a rod, there's a bacterium, there's another, another. So if that was our field, we got five bacteria in there. Because that it's just that simple. So try don't try to make count bacteria. I have to analyze the size and the shape and I, I'm not sure that this is really the right size for a bacteria. It is. Count it. You know, how about like that guy right there? Is that the right size? Of yes, it is. No, yeah, just count them all. all these little, tiny, you know, little rod shaped guys, little cock size, fat ones, short, a little bit. Anything that looks pretty dot size, a little bit rod shaped, is most likely a bacterium. Count it and be on your way. I get, you know how you are with your student? You want to be absolutely perfectly correct. And this is a qualitative assessment. We're just trying to get a ballpark idea. Do you have one million bacteria or two million bacteria? If we have 2.1 million bacteria, what does it matter? We're in the right ballpark. Or do you have 200 million or do you have 2,000 million? Those differences of what we would really like to know. What's the diversity of the bacteria? Do you have pretty good diversity or oh boy, what do you need to work on? So don't get too bent out of shape trying to count some of this stuff. Fungi, couple strands. So we're after the filamentous fungi, not the yeast. We start seeing yeast in, and you, you know, just start crying. Um, so we're looking for the strands. Remember, it has a uniform diameter, but right? you've got to focus along that length and make sure that it's in focus before you decide if it is uniform diameter or not. So if I ask you, is this a fungal strand, what would you say? You need to focus along it. You need to focus along it. You cannot look at me and say, no, I'm not focus. Because how do you know? This part of the fungus is not in focus. You're going to have to focus along it. 
And once you do focus along it, we'll get this in focus and get that in focus and get that and that. Yeah, so this uniform diameter all the way along. So the part that is in, how do you tell what part of this is in focus? Crisp. Crisp sharp edges, exactly. So where do you find the crisp sharp edges? Right in there, right? So what's the diameter on that fungal hypha? Find your littlest bacteria. Now how many of those little bacteria can line up across there? Three, two, four. Two, two and a half, somewhere in there, that's what I'd say. Yeah, so um, you know, don't overestimate. So take that little guy, one, two, two and a half, somewhere in there. How many bacteria in here? So we got, you know, pretty good diversity of bacteria. We have to pollute the bacteria to be able to count them. But we want to be seen you know, some good fungi in there, so don't dilute too much. So you dilute all your fungi and you can't find anything. So typically like a 1 to 5 dilution, 1 gram of your sample into 4 mils of water, or 1 gram into 9 mils of water. Those are usually the dilutions that you're going to be using to <coughs> find the fungi. If you're at 1 to 10 and you can't find any fungi, back off to a 1 to 5. There is a flagellate in this picture. Can you find him? But he's not moving, so he's really hard to pick out. Because, oh my gosh, you know, flagellate, uh, which one of these little round things is your actually, is your flagellate? Well, he's right here. How do I know? Because I watched him move before I snapped the picture. So it's that movement that really lets you say, ah, oh, flagellate. Remember, they have that bumbling motion, and that's what really gets in the way. Is this a fungus? Mm. Yeah, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Nice uniform diameter all the way along. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it's that branch, and that brings a little lot of focus, I can't really say. But is it a good fungus or a bad fungus? Mm. Yeah, color? Diameter is pretty good. It's maybe a two and a half, three. And what else are we looking at here? See the cross walls? Yeah. Yeah. So really nice cross walls in there. So it's got to be a basidium, I see. It has to be a good guy fungi. Here's a nice sand green. Real sharp edges. Real refractive kind of color to it. Lots of good aggregates. But you know, it doesn't have a lot of humic acid in here. And it doesn't have a lot of fulvic in those aggregates. So, is this sample better or worse than the last one? And so you can start doing some of these kinds of comparisons. So, how about these fungi? Now, I like it when we have a tea that looks like this. And this is a composed tea. This is made by some of the guys that we work with at the University of Arizona that are putting out a number of publications showing just how beneficial compost made correctly, compost tea made correctly, you see. And so you start looking at some of the fungi in here. Again, you want to find the part that's in focus in order to determine what the diameter is. But if they're nice and brown, these guys. Well, we've got some clear ones over here. Clear one back there, but it's hard to see if it's in focus. But how many strands of fungi in this field of view? So much. Yeah. So this one, and then we've got this one, and we got that one. I'm already telling you that one, and that one, and that one. So what? Five different strands of fungi. Whoa! If you can get five strands of fungi in every field in your compost tea. Uh, we need to crown him compost king. And um, I don't can't even manage that all that well myself. Ew, this looks messy, doesn't it? Now it's a little bit wider diameter. So you look at some of these, uh, there may be three. A little bit wider, a little bit wider, so we're up around a four, but clear. So I, you know, I'm a, hmm. Might not be a bad fungus, but it might not be a good fungus. So lots of fungus like this. I think <coughs> a little worried that we're in the middle of a fungal disease outbreak. I want to see some better fungi in here than this. It's all kind of one species, huge mass of this 
one particular species, I'm a little worried that um, we're in the middle of an outbreak. So I would probably say to my client or the person I'm working with, you know, I think you really need to work on getting some better fungi in here. All you've got are clear fungi in and a little small diameter, but these are not particularly good fungi. You need to work pretty hard at this. Now notice with some of these fungi, some of these strands, that okay, you have these interesting little burps right here. Like look at that strand. Um, uniform diameter and then this big burp, and then the height that keeps on but it's much narrower. What's going on there? Anyway, you said it's got a uniform diameter all the way along. There's not a full height. Well, here's an exception for you. Especially when you get massive amounts of fungi like this. Um, quite often, as the fungus is growing along and it goes, I don't have food here to keep me alive. I'm going to have to go dormant. One of the ways that fungi have to go dormant is to select one of portions of the cell where all of the cytoplasm from the surrounding areas of the hyphae rush into that area. It will wall off that area, and then this turns into a spore. A particular kind of spore we call that is a chlamydospore. So you can see we have several places in here where that chlamydospore is starting to form. So this fungus was probably growing very rapidly, lots of really good food, and then uh-oh, ran out. So we have a number of chlamydospores starting to form in here. So don't let that put you off if it is a fungus. Will they eventually separate all the way off? Um, the rest of the fun that hypha, those empty hyphae, will eventually be decomposed by something. And then you're just left with the chlamydospore. And if you have to be shaking your sample, you may well break all of those hyphae off the chlamydospore, so you just get the chlamydospore left. A bunch of dead, empty, you know, destroyed from the hyphae that you're going. Uh, it sort of looks like a full hypo, but I mean, I got it's falling apart and it's kind of decomposing. Yeah, so don't count it if it's kind of mm, not quite there. Can you go a little bit more about, okay, it's a bad fungus, and the reason it's a bad fungus, and so it's destroying our plant material, and the reason it is is because the plant material doesn't have a bigger year. How does that Usually when you have a root system, and if you don't have a really good, when you're, when you're looking at your root cell, if you don't have some nice thick cell walls protecting that root cell, uh, then if that cell is weak and wimpy, wimpy, the plant is stressed because it doesn't have enough nutrients to maintain a nice thick cell well, protect itself, if it doesn't have the exudates to be growing a good, healthy castle wall, then when a disease causing fungus comes in here, it can pretty easily chew up that cell wall material and get through and start causing necrosis. So, you know, it's when that cell wall is not got the strength it needs, when that plant stress, that plant material is just wimpy, it's, it's weak. Like when you don't have enough nutrients, you tend to be a lot more susceptible of all kinds of diseases and problems because you just don't have the strength to keep up your immune system. The immune system on a plant is really that cell wall. So, and then the good, the good fungi don't have the bad fungi, that's why they're good. So, you know, if, um, if we've got some good fungi in here, so imagine we had some good fungi growing in there. Now when that disease-causing fungus comes calling, these good guy fungi have already used up the food. They're already occupying all the infection sites along that. Even though it's a sick, unhappy, wimpy plant cell, the infection sites here are already occupied. So, you know, there's fungus here occupying that space, and now our disease-causing fungus can't even get close. The surface don't hurt the plant further? No, nope, the good guys don't um, have the enzymes, they don't have the DNA to do the attack on the root system. They were there because there was nutrients, though. Yep, but they 
they don't cross that cell wall and start feeding the inside to their land cells. They just don't have a genetic ability to do that, so they don't do that. Yep. They may be eating other organic matter, they may be eating whatever exudates are coming out. So we don't see the disease. So disease causing fungi have a particular sets of enzymes to allow them to attack and chew through and, and get inside the root system and eat it out, decompose it. The yeah. stuff that comes out of the disease causing fungi though, is that good soil building material? Well, it's, it, that disease causing fungus is um, making more fungus to continue to grow into your root and destroy your plant, but it is spitting out some waste material. And there are other bacteria and fungi that will grow on that waste material. So, you know, it's not complete loss. What you'd really like to see is those disease causing fungi attacking your weeds. Yeah. And not the plants you want. So let's make sure our weeds are the things that are stressed and unhappy and unhealthy. And you cause that if you make certain that you keep that nitrate and the ammonium levels really low. So your weeds just can't get the high nitrate that it needs in order to grow. And then your disease causing fungi can take them out. And good guys fungi continue to protect the roots of my good, um, of the plants that I want. Now, just to keep going, because we haven't been anywhere we're supposed to be. Um, see how on that hypha, we have another hypha grow, a real short one growing up here, and now we've got this circular almost like a balloon on the end of that little short hypha growing out. So if I can draw it for you, there's our hypha, little short hyphae right there, and on the end of that we've got a, a balloon. So when we're looking at that, that's another way for our fungus to go into a dormant stage. So those on the end of these little short stems are typically called sporangia or a sporangia 4, just to give you more verbiage, and a sporangium or a sporangia 4 will bud spores off the surface of the balloon and typically billions and billions of chains of spores are produced going out into the soil solution. So lots of reproductive profit yields, lots of spores going out in an effort for that fungus to allow dispersal and life at a later time for the, its particular species. Oftentimes when you look at these underneath the microscope, people call them medusa heads. Because there are just billions and billions of these little spores going out in these chains. So a sporangium or a sporangium 4. On slightly better fungi, we can get the same sort of function happening, but usually we have a slit. So if we have these little subset hyphae, little tiny hyphae, each one of these may split off and now start budding out spores. So just a different structure. So not necessarily a little round ball like that, but little fingers. And amazingly enough, they're called phyalis, which means fingers. And that's typical of penicillium, for example. So if you look at a penicillium fungus, you'll see these little phyalids, and you know, if you see that in your samples, you know exactly what kind of fungus that is. And then a slightly higher fungi, when they bud off one of these round balloons, they will form spores inside, and then instead of being called conidia, or instead of being called sporangia, they are called conidia. So if you see the spores inside, okay, you're pretty probably pretty well safe that those are good guy fungi. 
If you see the violets and the spores off the little fingers, probably pretty good. But if you see the sporangia, the medusa head, mm, those are there's some pretty nasty disease causing fungi there. So in fungi, lots of variation. And the lower back of that last picture. Whoa! I would say you've got a disease outbreak happening here. You're right in the middle of it. Maybe the symptoms haven't appeared on the leaves and the branches on the plant itself. But whoa, I want to get some good guy fungi out there. I want to cover my leaf surfaces and protect my plants against this because this is probably a disease outbreak in the happening. So lots and lots of fungi. Let's be aware of whether they're good guys or bad guys. So there's another one of those um, chlamydospores. Right there. That was the spore. It germinated and started to grow. There it was. And the side I just don't have any food. So making a chlamydospore to try to move over to you know, weather this period of no food. So diameters. Um, this is the 400x magnification, so it just got a little bit higher. Um, this is another thing. When you've got a fungal hypha and one of it, one end of it has a little round knob, suspect that this is the spore from which this fungal hypha germinated. Don't dismiss that it's not a fungus. So, you know, all these wonderful exceptions I'm giving you now. More fungal stuff. Here's a fungal spore. And in any of these spores that are multicellular and dark in color like this are bad news. These are spores of disease causing fungi typically. This one happens to be fusarium. Now, fusarium is probably not actually a disease-causing fungus. It's an opportunist. It only attacks plants that are sick and unhealthy, unhappy, something else is causing the initial problem, but then the fusarium comes in and just like wildfire wild fire through your greenhouse, through your hydroponic system. So fusarium is really an anthem in the greenhouse industry because it just spreads so fast and once it gets going. So you start seeing spores like this, and especially in a hydroponic system, and you just want to go ballistic and do everything you can to prevent those two fusarium from being able to take hold and take off. So uh, particular species, you can have some fun Googling fusarium spores and looking at the different morphologies of fusarium. Lots and lots of different species. Back in the, you know, the turn of the century, 1800s, fusarium was not considered a fungal pathogen. And if you had said to somebody at that era that fusarium was a fungal pathogen, you would have destroyed your reputation in the scientific world. Everybody knew it was just a normal, average, typical, everyday fungus that you find in soil. So in 1920, there was a researcher that uh, was researching these diseases in greenhouses that were just wiping everything out. And he kept isolating fusarium, he kept isolating fusarium. So he did a few experiments. Took the fusarium, inoculated sterile plants, looked at what happened, yep, all the symptoms of this horrible greenhouse disease, isolated the fusarium, inoculated it into a next set of plants, and yet fusarium caused this horrible greenhouse disease. So he uh, attempted to get that paper published, and he was absolutely and totally laughed out of the scientific world. He uh, destroyed his career. He was invited to leave the university position that he was at because he just clearly did not understand how to do science. One of the people who reviewed his paper did a few more experiments and about um, 10 years later published exactly the same set of experiments and he is now uh, he was then looked upon as the person who saved the greenhouse industry because he discovered the cause of this terrible disease 
scientists. They are human beings first. We are human beings before we're anything else. And then maybe we adhere to, okay, so just keep that in mind when we get people that are uh, maybe, how do you protect yourself from that? Where's the data? Ask me where the data are. Start doing your own observations and your own tests and make sure that uh, you can replicate some of this stuff. Um, this is an amoeba spore. Did, oh, cyst, excuse me, it's not a spore. It's a cyst. Typically, amoeba have an inner wall and then an outer wall. And quite often, this outer wall will be kind of ornamented like this one is. See how it's a little bit, uh, you know, fancy on the outside, a little bit lace like on the outside. So, amoeba cyst. Tell me, good God, so I'm going to spag up for this. Why is it good God? Now look at the diameter. Is that not great? Woo! That's a diameter on that body. Now, where's my smallest bacteria? So, like that little bacterium, you one of those. How many of those are you going to line up across there? Six, yeah. seven. Six, seven? Yeah, really nice. Uh, Testing it up. Uh, this is a spore, so when we're looking at one of those spores that's multicellular, or at least it's clear. So, yeah, no big deal. Would that be a bacillus my seeds? Yes, this would have to be a bacillus my seeds, because only a bacillus my seeds have those set up. Uh, and you don't want to do like that. So, no, I just don't want to do that. Algo strand. So, all these pictures, 400 total magnification. First thing that gives away an alga is the photosynthetic pigments. Nice green color like that. So um, algae, uh, this cell is right up next to the next cell. There is no cell wall, there's no space in between. So each cell is adjoined right to the next cell like that. When we deal with cyanobacteria, And this structure is called a hetero 
cysts. So the typical morphology of cyanobacteria, that's some here with algae. Well, sooner or later when you're looking at soils, especially here in Hawaii, where you get a lot of water logging that occurs, or you're going to be looking at taro patches or rice or something, you start to want to know what that, what those things are. Ooh, Elaine, it's modern art picture. What is this a picture of? Yeah, this is somebody who doesn't have a condenser and is not chatting. So what are we looking at? You can see why it would be impossible when you're looking at a root cell without the condenser and the um, shadowing ability to be able to distinguish where the fungi are in this root system. Can you find them? You can barely make out the individual root cells, much less where you think the fungi are in those, in those root cells. It's a little hard to tell where the root begins and where it ends because it's so indistinct and without that shadowing ability, it's, it's really hard to tell that, yeah, that's still a root cell out there. We still have root cells out here about here. You're looking at a lateral root that's budding and growing straight out of you, out at you in this picture. You've got the sloth root cells here. How do I know there are fungi in here? How would you possibly tell? So do, do the best job you can. See if you can figure out where the fungal hyphae are. We stain this with fluorescein diacetate. So all I'm going to do is turn off the bright field lamp, turn on the fluorescent lamp, and did you pick out the fungi? Anybody in here get the fungi correct? You absolutely can see them. So fungal hyphae growing in between the cells of the root cell, of the root. In between the root cells, not actually in the root cells, that are in the root, kind of. They're in the spaces between the cells. Here's some honey going out into the soil, collecting nutrients, bringing it back, and feeding the fungus. And now here, we have the initial infection stage of one of the root cells with mycorrhizal fungus. We are starting to form an arbuscule here. So the initial stage of arbuscular formation is so all of this fungal hyphae is connected. This is going out collecting nutrients, bringing it back in, and translocating it to the arbuscule, where the actual exchange between the plant and the fungus takes place. So hopefully we've got it plant material here, we've got any ink, we've got some vinegar, and we can spend a little bit of time a little bit later this afternoon to see if we can get some of our own um, root systems stained up and see the fungal hyphae. Endo. 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 This is all endo fungi. So uh, this is an onion root, and I, I don't know if you can tell, but there's an onion root right here that's not colonized. You can see part of the onion root not colonized, not colonized, not colonized. There's another root going off right here, not colonized. But because the arbuscules produce a fluorescent compound, they will are easily picked up if you have a epifluorescent microscope. You just wash your root up, slap them underneath the microscope, turn the UV lamp on, and bingo, you can tell where you're colonized and where you aren't. <laughs> So pretty simple. Up close and personal on the arbuscules. So that's an arbuscule. There's another one, another one, another one. So they're all connected together by those fungal hyphae going through root cells and root cells. Vesicles. So when the plant says, thank you, my fungus, fungus, it's been a good year, but I've got all the nutrients I need, I'm going into reproductive mode. I'm going to walk you off. You've done a good job. Wake up and come back next year. So walled off by the plant itself, and so now these are vesicles. Shelf life on these things is only about nine months. But when you think about end of the growing season, the roots go to sleep, the plant goes dormant, these vesicles survive, they make it through that dormant season. So the beginning of the next growing season, they're all ready to colonize the next growth of roots for the next year. I'm sorry, Those are vesicles. They are the dormant stage 
of the mind and the endomycorrhizal fungi. So like BAM, IR. Yeah. Is that how perennials do it? Yeah, that would, that would be how perennial make sure that it's going to be colonized. The new root growth next spring gets colonized from these waking up and infecting next year's plant. Because this is about a nine month shelf life. But make sure when you're buying mycorrhizal inoculum that you are not buying the vesicles inside the root. Uh, because it's only going to be viable for about nine months. So by the time they, by the time they grow plants, by the time they harvest the roots once the vesicles have been formed, once they dry that all out, once they chop it up, once they put it into one of those little packages, those tin foil packages, all nicely dehydrated, and that actually makes it to the warehouse, and that actually sits in the warehouse until somebody's ready to sell it. How long has that been? Two, three years. So get the stuff that they put to store. So get the spores that are from the outside of the root. These are extra matrical spores. So you want the spores that grow on the hyphae outside the root. These are the shelf life of like forever. These are real spores, not vesicles. These are spores. And these have a really long shelf life. Now this has been stained with a blue stain. When we used the India ink, it would appear black in color. So maybe we should have, um, be able to do that this afternoon and see if we have any roots with mycorrhizal colonization. Um, so how do they make mycorrhizal inocula? They'll grow um, roots where they inoculate it with uh, correct mycorrhizal spores. And they'll check the root systems and make sure the morphology is correct. They will then take that plant, so we're usually doing this in the greenhouse operations. <coughs> we'll wash those roots off gently, and then we'll arrange the roots over a wire ring, so we're going to do aeroponics. So the roots of those plants are hanging down in space. You know, tin foil or some covering, so above ground, the uh, plants get in photosynthesis. Photosynthase going down into the root system. It is colonized with the mycorrhizal fungus. So the mycorrhizal fungus happily growing away. You're spritzing it with a little uh, fertilizer, no phosphorus, no phosphates, very little, low in levels of nitrogen typically. And then we're just, as that um, plant food is washing those root systems, when these spores are ripe, Ready to go, they will wash off the root system. So, down below the roots of the plant, we can collect um, those spores on the sieve surface. So, every morning, comes, someone comes in and just rinses all the spores off into um, a container, dries them down, sieve goes back underneath the plant to collect more. And the nutrient solution just goes around and around and around. So, it didn't work. Um, but it's the, it's the way that's been developed. We cannot grow these fungi except on the plants. What size are these? Um, these are typically um, about um, 10 to 25 micrometers in diameter, depending on which species. So this is Lawrence Mossy. So we're looking at probably about 10, cent, 10 micrometers across here. These are large spores. Gigaspora typically has some, um, you know, we're looking at 20, maybe 30 micrometers across, really large. And if they're not stained like this, they're a nice dark brown color. You think it's possible to buy a inoculum, uh, some spores from one of these labs and have a benefit in our perennials? Yeah, I would expect so. And um, because most of our grow crop, most of our veggies, most of our deciduous trees are not picky about what kind of mycorrhizal fungi get colonized in the root of the system. The things that are really picky are about the con conifers. Any of your evergreens are very picky about what kind of acto mycorrhizal fungi colonize the root system. What about the macna? Macnets, mm, they don't really care. They are endo mycorrhizal. Um, so, citrus. citrus, same thing. They're very unselective as long as it's an endo mycorrhizal fungus, so really form a, a, a connection with any of them. And it's fun looking at the systems because you'll have this section colonized by this mycorrhizal fungus, the next little bit is a different one, the next little bit's a different one, the next little bit is a different one. 
So you can have quite a few species all on the same tree. Conifers, real different. So a little higher magnification, a little larger score that we're looking at here. And the hypha that connects it to the fungus growing in the roots. Does, does ginger and ginseng pollinate? Like yep, mycorrhizal? ginger and ginseng both uh, should be uh, mycorrhizal. Um, None of our mycorrhizal spores are ornamented. So if you see spores like this, anything with ornamentation, no little spiky things, no little fancy lacy stuff on mycorrhizal spores, always just very smooth outer layers, typically double walled if your mycorrhizal spore. This happens to be pythium. So if you start seeing these kinds of spores in your roots, ah, start to get a little worried. Again, online you can uh, Google the morphology of disease causing fungi in roots. And you'll come up with typically quite a herd of pictures of what these things look like in your root systems. So there's no way then to wake up the mycorrhizal spores before you put them in your orchard. Um, you would have to put them into um, a high concentration of humic acid. So most of these mycorrhizal spores wake up if you get a pretty good level of humic acid into your compost tea. Which is why we recommend to you that you do not put your mycorrhizal spores in at the beginning of a tea brew. Because these spores wake up maybe 4 to 18 hours after you put them into a mycorrhizal, uh, into a tea. And as soon as these spores germinate, they are very sensitive to being touched. I had an Erlenmeyer flask of mycorrhizal spores that I had just started to germinate. And I picked up that the uh, Erlenmeyer flask, removed it, and killed them all. They are just so sensitive to that um, effect of putting them down on the bench top and most of them hitting against the bottom of the Erlenmeyer flask. If they're still uh, ungerminated, uh, you can run a two billion ton truck over them and won't bother at all. Run them through uh, Egyptian mummy fluid. Yeah, no problem. As soon as they germinate, don't even look at them cross-eyed. So we want to get the spores on the roots. Like your plant, now as your plant is putting out the exudates, yes, you'll wake up those spores and zoom in and they'll go. Uh, put a lot of good condos tea down, put some humic acid down when you um, plant those trees. Um, seeds, make sure the mycorrhizal spores are on the seeds. Plant your seeds with some humic acid in there. Why not compost tea or compost extract with humic acid? And that seems to really help wake them all up and get them moving. So, how many fungal pathogens do we have in this picture? Can you tell if they're fungal pathogens? Now look at that guy. What's the diameter on that and what color is he? There's a disease causing fungus for you. Yeah, some more disease, more disease, some more. And if that was a little bit more in focus. Ah, this is what fusarium typically looks like in a root. Your whole root cell is chopped a block with these spores. So, yeah, scary. This is sclerotium. This is a guy that causes pink rot or white rot in most of our agricultural plant species. So we don't want to see these little um, bunches of grapes is what people call them. It looks like just a bunch of grapes, doesn't it? So we do not want to be seeing that in our soil. And if you start seeing them, Make certain that you get something back into that root system, into your soil, to combat that particular problem. We have a number of places on the mainland where we, by law, cannot grow onion and we cannot grow garlic because the sclerotinia problem is so bad that if you put onions or garlic, any root crop like that, into that area, you're going to be wiped out really fast. You're just going to exacerbate that particular problem. So by law, you're not supposed to plant those kinds of plants in that area. Well, gee, that's 
really hard for some growers. They have land they can't do their cash crop in. So what we typically do is come in with uh, compost in the fall, three applications of compost tea in the springtime, and usually we soak the bulbs or we actually soak the seeds in the compost tea, and then typically we can make a crop without any trouble. But there are no chemical fungicides that will touch sclerotinia. It's um, unmanageable except by getting the competitors back into the soil. So you first have you. I had an unrelated question, but several of us had composts that were pretty high in bacterial, not much fungus, not much protozoa. I was thinking that maybe that compost might be useful for extracting human acids from. Yep, absolutely. Yep, that would be really good oh, for that. So run some water for you and figure out how much humic is in there. Is there a good source to find out what plants like endo and what plants like ecto? Yeah. Yep. If you go to um, mycorrhizal applications okay. to their website, so mycorrhizal.com, I think is what their website is. That's a dealer, right? This is Mike Amaranthus, and, and he's been doing a lot of work on mycorrhizal fungi for a very long time. Okay. And if you go to their website and then kind of go down the page, be three quarters of the way down their main page, there's just a blank spot and with a little button that says go. Type in your plant that you want to find out about. Hit the go button and it will pop you to the page that tells about everything we know about what the mycorrhizal requirement for that plant actually is. So there's a lot of plants that we don't know. No one's looked. No one's done any work on it. So, um, but just like he mentioned, magnets and you said, oh, it's all endo, they like it, so that's good. Yeah. yeah. So in most deciduous trees, you can be pretty self assured that it's going to be endo. Yeah. Compost, evergreens, acto mycorrhizal. So we're, there's the root of this hemlock. And you can see where the hemlock now gets completely covered on the outside by the fungus. So again, you're looking along that root, see how it's a layer, a sheath of the fungal hyphae growing on the outside of the root. And when that root gets colonized, now you have all these little lateral roots or feeder roots feeder roots that are popping up in a lot more surface area, a lot better exchange, but these roots are supporting the growth of the hyphae growing out into the soil. So these hyphae got ripped off when this was pulled out of the soil. So we're looking at you know, that going on in the soil, collecting nutrients, bringing it back to the plant. In the case of the ectos, the colonization is just one cell layer into the surface of that root. And that's where the exchange of nutrients or sugars from the plants. That's where it's in these conifers. Many conifers, like eucalyptus, will be both endo as well as ecto mycorrhizal. Um, rhododendron will be endo, ecto, as well as um, IR or um, ericoid colonized. So, you know, some interesting little subsets. If you're trying to grow blueberry, if you're trying to grow cranberry, things like that, those are ericoid mycorrhizal fungal species. And they, you got to find a whole different inoculum. There is no existing inoculum of ericoid mycorrhizal fungi on the market. You've got to go out to an existing plot of those plants, pull some of the root systems, inoculate your blueberries or your cranberries or whatever. You know, I have concerns about like that, that with taro. Because taro is an Asian plant. How specific is it for the particular mycorrhizal fungi? Is it truly endo? Or is it ericoid? Or I don't know. I have a little doubt or not. So, so uh, you've seen that endo one? No, I haven't, but what, what type of sorry, what type of um, Michael Ryan will do blueberry for me. Ericoid. So, Ericoid, we spell that for you. E R I C O I D. Ericoid. Michael Ryan. So, 
So it's just a, when you look in at aeroid mycorrhizal fungi, so um, you know, in your in your root where you've got a bunch of different cells. Aeroid mycorrhizal fungi, the fungus grows into the root system and will find the infection site, move through the cell wall, causes the cell membrane to invaginate, and now puts a coil of the mycorrhizal hyphae inside. So instead of an arbuscule, you have this little coil that's completely surrounded by the membrane of the plants. And so the exchange is from the coils to the membrane of the plant. But really distinctive looking coils inside. Whereas when we're deal dealing with the VAM, secular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, here we're calling it. VAM, the arbuscules, look like little trees. So as we're looking with our media ink, you might want to be taking pictures when you find some uh, mycorrhizal structures inside the root system, and uh, you and I can have a discussion about, hmm, is that aeroid or is that something else? Another ecto mycorrhizal fungus. So look at how different the morphology is. This one compared to the last one. So this is on a different plant. This is on a different store, I think. And uh, all the hyphae that go off into the soil, this particular species is Telophora. So just a different species. Each species looks different. So different kinds of spores. We don't really count the spores. You might want to, there might be a reason for you to pay attention to them. You might want to, you know, how much of an inoculant is hanging around. Might be something that you want to look at. The hyphae, you know, some of the characteristics, reproductive structures, so we've gone over all of those, so you should at least be able to go back into the notebook and find examples of all of those things. When we look at diameter, so I'm going to add the actinobacteria in here on the fungal categories, not quite kosher, but Hopefully, you understand the reason why I'm putting it there. In the past, actinobacteria used to be called actinomyces. You've probably seen that name in some of the older literature. We call them myces, which means fungus, because they grew filaments. So, of course, that can be fungi, right? Oops. Um, no, they don't. So when you look at an actinobacterium up at high magnification, you will see the individual bacterial cells inside the filament. It's a bacterium. It has the DNA of bacteria. It has the enzymes. It only has one chromosome. The chromosome is attached to the uh, membrane. It's not in a nuclear um, position. It's a bacterium. The first person, and here's another one of those little um, lessons for you. First person that um, really started studying actinomyces and started documenting that the DNA is that of bacteria, not that of fungi, is prokaryote. Actinomyces are really prokaryotic organisms. They do not have eukaryotic DNA. Their membranes are those of prokaryotes, not membranes of eukaryotes. And of course, he sent his paper, uh, when he was doing his PhD, he sent that paper into um, the American Society of Microbiology to have it published. And the people who reviewed his paper were just like, this person is crazy, he should never be allowed a PhD, he shouldn't be in the science, you know, kick him out, he doesn't know what he's talking about, just really embarrassing. And uh, luckily, his PhD wasn't on that particular topic, so he still got his PhD. But you know, he kind of has some burn marks at one side. 
Um, and when people who read the newspaper came out to some number of years later and uh, basically presented all of the information about the credit um, for this discovery. So, how many times in the scientific world can we repeat this for you? Quite a few. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Be careful when you discover something. It's a little difficult sometimes to get credit for it. So, actinobacteria is what these things are actually. The name is now officially changed. We should use that term, not actinomyces. Well, but in some of the older literature, you will find that name, and so you need to be familiar with what it is. It is actinobacteria, the American um, Society for Microbiology Taxonomic Committee has officially changed this to actinobacteria. But I include it here because it is a filament. We need to be able to recognize it. We will narrow the diameter hyphae. There are bacteria, not that hyphae. Oomycetes, which is a group within the fungal king kingdom, typically bear narrow diameter hyphae, and many of these fungi will produce a modal stage. Remember when we were talking about the um, <coughs> Some of these fungi, when this canidium bursts open, those individual spores will actually have a flagellum on them. And they look very much like flagellus when they're moving through your soil solution. They only live about eight hours, but they are modal zoospores and they are moving off to find another place to start another disease infection. So most of these oomycetes are, in fact, disease-causing fungi. They are clear. They have this modal stage. And because it has that modal stage, there are many people in the world of um, mycology that are saying, these are not fungi at all. These are protozoa. And they should be put in the protozoa kingdom. And we have other people that are saying, well, they're not fungi, they aren't protozoa really, because they have these filamentous, so they should go into their own kingdom. So you're right in the middle of all of that, you know, uh, do we call them a different kingdom altogether? Do we keep calling them fungi? I, mean, I don't know, I don't care. They cause problems, narrow diameter, white, fungi. So if you go, go to, um, Wikipedia right now, and you type in oh, my seeds, they will give you the new taxonomic designation. So Wikipedia has fallen for the, uh, the new designation. The world of mycology has not yet accepted those new designations. So right now, don't be talking to any mycologist about this because you're going to get a reaction. I don't know, when we settle this kind of thing, you're going to go around on this one. Is their movement, is their movement different from other flagellates? No, they are pretty much very similar. It's hard Does to tell. Does it only have one flagellum? It only has one flagellum on it, typically. So if you're really good about, you know, shadowing, you should be able to differentiate between those that have only one and those that maybe have a, a true flagellate is only, always going to have two, or it can have one, two, so you want to be looking for, you know, most of us are just looking for the, the bumble. Yeah. And, and, yeah. But those spores don't last very long. So they're probably, it's probably just not worth it to worry too much about it. And if you see bumbling motion, it's a it's a pleasure. Ascomycetes then, which there are some disease causing fungi in the world of ascomycetes, most of them are okay or good guys. They are wider diameter and then a really wide diameter. Brown color, septate. Anything that's septate always is going to be falling in here. And um, uniformly septate and brown always is going to be here. If it's clear and septate, it's probably, it's probably an astronomy So, you know, how, how in depth do you want to be in separating out goodness of your fungi? Um, take it a little bit further than I perhaps have. When we have our fungi growing, and we're looking at like a 
spore germinating and the hive folks coming out from it. So we've got our spore and then here's our hypha. Usually what you see is this doesn't have a very thick cell wall on it. It's just kind of gray and fuzzy. So when you see a fungal hypha and it's gray and fuzzy on that end and then you see it getting a more and more solid cell wall, okay, you can typically say something about this is probably a growing fungal tip. If you're looking at a strand of fungus that has got real thick cell walls, well, it's probably not a growing fungus. So do you want to pay attention to these criteria? Do you, how much interest is it to you to differentiate these things? And so I leave it up to you to decide because you can start picking out those sorts of things. Now, remember when we were talking about compost tea? I talked about this. How many of you remember what this means? So there's our fungal hypha. And see how it's just completely a mesh all the way along the way. All the way along. All those bacteria, all those little rods, all those little cocks like just completely attacking and consuming your fungal hypha. So under anaerobic conditions, what happens to our filamentous fungi? Say goodbye to them. And this process only takes about 20 minutes. So if you're dealing with a tea and you can find absolutely no fungal filaments in there. If you're dealing with a compost, that absolutely no fungal filaments. If you're a compost that has no flagellates, no amoebae, might you be in fact, sometime during that composting process or your compost tea brewing process, you actually went in a rubbish. And also, something you might really want to consider is that Mother Nature is trying to give you a message. No filamentous fungi, no flagellus, no amoebae. Hmm. Let's take a good look at your uh, processing. Now what's going on? So just a number of different pictures of that variety to give you an idea of, yeah, when it's pretty well covered. Yeah, it's completely covered. Now if you have a little aggregate when the fungus is going through that, no big deal. Because it's only right where that aggregate is that your fungal hypha is covered. And nice, clear, no bacteria going on to it. Don't worry. But when the whole thing is covered with bacteria, when you see these little fuzzy, wuzzy thingies, you probably ought to be concerned that there's a fungus somewhere in the middle of that. You can't even see it. You're losing your fungi. Get that aerobic as fast as you can. Is at all possible. Protozoa. So the things protozoa do for you. There's a flagellate. One flagellum, the other flagellum, so we always really want to have two. You may have two flagella coming off the same side, so you know, good aggregates, lots of bacteria in there. Amini ooze. So you're looking at a pseudopod right here. This thing is going to ooze in that direction. You got some pseudopods, false And this thing is oozing that away. Cyst. So remember what I said about a mean cyst double layer stone. Ornamental. So look at how pretty that is. Isn't it cute? Look at this look on the other side. There's a really good book by Curtis on the Kingdom of Protozoa that has pictures of all the different um, flagellates, amoebae, and ciliates. It um, costs about $600. If you can find it at the library, copy it. Um, because it's well worth it if you're interested in being able to identify protozoa. Test data media. So lots of different kinds of tests. But this particular one you can see the amoeba outside. So this guy happy, chewing down, you know, slurping up bacteria out here. And so you can see what one of these test data media looks like when it's outside its test. So, what happens to that? 
They are telling you some really bad news. When these guys get tired of whatever bacteria they, they need all the good ones and they're dying and don't feed me any more It pulls those cilia in, pulls this together in a round ball and lowers itself just like, you know, um, the, 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 the ball that nears the drop slowly just pulls itself right in. And when it gets down there, it kind of thinks about this for a while and then goes, Oi! And off it goes. And you have to follow it, right? You just, you, where to go, where to go? And you look all over and you finally find it. Set up housekeeping someplace else. And they are so fun to watch, but they do mean really not so wonderful things. And for those of us who worry about, am I identifying these things exactly right? This is another organism that is exactly like your um, stoxylians. It has a whole fence. It pushes itself out, you know, kind of elongates, and there the cilia. And it's um, setting up the vortex. You can see the vortex that it's making here. It consumes, it filter feeds bacteria. But this is not a single cell organism. Protozoa are single cells, they are microorganisms. But this guy is a eukaryote. He is multicellular. And so he pulls himself together and these cells just accordion together. And then he stretches the accordion out. You can go back and forth. Yeah, the same thing that a eukaryote is doing is exactly what a prokaryote does. Same function. <coughs> Bad news when you see these guys, keep them that it may be. It means you're in stagnant water. It means you're growing some mosquito larvae. And you maybe want to add some uh, protozoa to wipe out aerobic protozoa to wipe out those, those mosquito larvae. Hmm, another bad organism. This is fly larvae. Hold fast on this end. The individual cells expand out. So when he's trying to move, these elongate, and then he puts his head down. And he pulls his whole fast in. It's kind of like I think of it like an accordion or an inch one, if you will. So out it goes, and then it pulls in the rear end, and out it goes. Fly larvae only grows in anaerobic conditions with reduced oxygen, where it's got billions and billions of bacteria to grow. So one of the things that attracts them on the fly are all the anaerobic smells. If we can prevent the anaerobic smells, we won't have the flies. So, you know, there's a correlation there. You know, you start seeing fly larvae in your compost or in your tea, you know exactly what that means now, right? You know, you've got anaerobic, something attracted mama fly, and what do you do to not have that happen? Different versions, you know, so different fly larvae. But they are, are all multicellular. You can see the organs in them. They have a lot of them, uh, pumping heart, if you will. So learn what it means. Ciliates. More ciliates. This is called a cocoda. Colpoda. He is so cute. He's a gold kidney. And he just, and he wanders around with that little mouth right here. Starts eating and he just spends his life grazing around on the surfaces of all that bacteria growing in there. And it's really cute. But he's telling you that things are going bad in your material. The soil salmon. Doesn't he look like a little fish? A little whiskers in the front? Oh, but bad news once again. Ciliates are really cute. <sighs> Too bad they are bad things. So there's our fungal hypha, all kinds of ciliate cysts, well that's bad news, you know, so uh, are these ciliates or are they flagellates? Ciliates. Because they're just moving really slow. There's a lack of bacillus, see them? Now, see, see how they're mobile? These guys are actually have Flagella, now there's one of those long um, 
lack of a sales I'm, I'm looking for, yeah. That wasn't an algae strand? That was not an algae strand. Um, this will probably play over. But that's a cilia. Uh, cilia. So high neck, looking at the cilia on the butt end of that, um, cilia on the rear end of that cilia. There's this mouth, and you can see lots of cilia along here, kind of a cone-like. Um, so there's another cilia, those cute little cilia, but those are flagellates in the body. That's a flagellate. Um, insect larvae here. Lots of lactobacillus. You know, so along with lactobacillus, you might expect to see insect larvae and a fair number of cilia as well. Although once we have a lack of a lot of the bad smells have gone away. So can we mask the bad smells by putting in something like lack of a Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, so um, Amoeba slowly oozing. These things, things can be really slow. Now the dogs just have to have a uh, significant sense of humor. Because why would you name 
something so funny looking, a laugh or an email. So, um, right here, the sweet, trying to call this guy the um, flying nun nematode. Because doesn't that remind you of Sally Field with the big um, headdress on her head? You know, and she could take off the little flying. And uh, that's, wow, looks like that. But the mouth itself is just kind of, oh, hum. Not, not much of anything there, just uh, softly it's going down to the uh, intestines. Nothing really exciting. So another one with big gorgeous lips. I can't, I just love big gorgeous lips. So Wilsonema, but again, you just you can't, there's there's nothing in it. it it's just dull and boring. So when you're looking at an avatar, you're just going dull and boring. It's a bacterial feeder. So just you know, get it written down and, and move on to the next one. So there's our whole nemato. Where's the mouth? Under the right side. Yeah, over here. So what do you see in that end of the nemato? Spear. Mm, no, no, that's the esophagus right here. Lips. Yeah, we've got we kind of kind of puckery lips is about it. You know, but that mouth is just dull, boring, not. Now, if you go along here, it has uh, a valve right here, so a median bulb is what that's called. If you go a little further along, it's got a basal bulb at the end of its esophagus. There's its intestines, and there's its uh, anus, so that sort of comes out. This happens to be a female, because you can see the vulva. But what we're really interested in is just that not because that tells us what it does. It's just dull and boring. You see? Yeah. Let's go. Cutie. How about this guy? Mm -hmm. Well, no. So that's the esophagus. That's its median bowl. It just has a little bit of overlap. So it doesn't have a basal bowl. Intestines. There's the anus. So look at the mouth. Anything interesting up there? No, no just kind of a little rectangular little mouth up there. Why am I showing you boring nematodes? So you get the confidence to say that's a boring mouth. It's a bacterial feeder. And most of what you'll see in those soils are bacterial feeders. Now, here's a great big mouth, but there's no teeth in there. It's just a great big square mouth. These guys that have a really big square mouth like this, for those of you who like detail, this is called an areolamid. Areo, areolamid. And it eats algae. Well, it'll also eat bacteria. It'll eat a protozoan if you can. It, It'll eat anything that fits in that mouth, anything that's stupid enough to get sucked in. It's going down the gullet. It doesn't really care. So an omnivore is what some people classify this as, as where? Well, oreolamid.
identification of organisms. So fungal seed nematode, so it's up there on the board, fungal seed nematode, style or steer, or another term, stylet. And so we're looking for this fairly refractive um, steer in its mouth. So you'll notice that it, it's kind of large. It's, there's no like little square mouth up here. And so we're looking for that kind of spear. Usually these spears are bigger and broader. But this particular genus, Telegrimus, not really noticeable, but it's so almost like this on the Yeah. Do they need good from them? Yep, they are completely um, indiscriminate as far as anybody knows. But they're the ones that turn our fungi into good food for... Yep, they release nutrients in a plant available form. So even if they're eating your good fungi, they're still doing good things for your plant. Now this guy, Laternema, has a much more distinctive sphere, much larger, and this is much more typical of your fungal feeding nematodes. They have this honking, big, shiny, broad sphere, typically not very long, but it's hard to miss. This particular nematode is a juvenile, because notice that he's, got, he's been making another sphere back here. So don't get confused if you see two spears. There's, there's three spears. It's just, he's a young one. And uh, he's going to shed his cuticle when he moves to the next larval stage. And when he sheds that cuticle, the spear goes with it. So then the next spear moves into place. He's larger, he eats more. So fungal feeding nematodes. They, they come up to the edge of your um, fungal hypha, take that spear, set up the hypha, and then suck out the internal contents. So of course, fungal feeding nematodes are going to be focused on the growing tips of fungi. They're not going to be back in the empty part of the fungal hypha. How long does the nematode live? How long does a nematode live? All of our, um, our um, studies on aging or how not to age are done on nematodes. Because these guys don't age. Um, ageless. So how do they get away with not, you know, wrinkles and old age yeah. stuff and, you know, the organs aren't falling apart. So how do they do it? So, um, Pseudoreptidus and Suck fungi. So see, you should only eat mushrooms. You should only drink beer. Because that's all fungal meat. So again, you know, take a look at this nematode. Fungal feeder, bacterial feeder, predatory. Well, it's just dull and boring at this end. It's bacterial feeder. Keep throwing these in for you. They go, no, it's really awesome. Back here, over here. Big mouth. Look at the fact that it's a hot and big nematode to begin with. Big mouth, and look at the tooth. And so when you see anything with these just gigantic mouths, and look for the tooth. Sometimes the tooth is up here, sometimes the tooth is back there. You know, so it can be in different positions. But as soon as you've seen that tooth, or even if it's just stepping mouth. Predatory nematode. Nematodes that eat other nematodes. And now these guys are really good at honing in on root feeding nematodes. They, for some reason, like root feeding nematodes. Probably because root feeding nematodes are getting a lot of good juicy plant food. And so a root feeding nematode is always a big delicious treat. So these guys hone in on it. And so you can see the way he's eating this nematode is exactly the same way he's most any root feeding nematode is just to grab him by the head, he kind of averts that mouth and clump um, down on the nematode, pulls it in and crunches around, and then pulls the next little bit, and nom 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 nom. Yep. nom 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 If you ever have the opportunity to watch a uh, predatory nematode eat another nematode, please film it, because uh, I think you can make a lot of money off of that. Um, there would be a lot of people that would really like to see that film 
up on YouTube or something like that. Roots eating on toes. Roots. Root hairs. Um, you know, a lot of people confuse root hairs for fungi. You know, so um, I'm trying not to do that. These are really big. So this is a fairly low magnification. This is not for under that. So there's our root nematode. It uses that cell to puncture the cell wall, sucks out the internal contents, moves to the next cell, punctures, and just goes right on down the root. A couple of root feeding nematodes per root system actually stimulate your plant to grow faster. So when you start getting up to one root feeding nematode per gram of soil, that we now have damage to the plants. So we want a little root feeding nematode, but we don't want a lot. We want Goldilocks. We want just the right amount. So you'll see some reports like that in scientific literature about a few root feeding nematodes are a good thing. I don't know. How do you keep them in hand? Okay, predatory nematodes. So see the style and the knots? This is the spear. Those are the knots, and that's what we're even looking for. So those knobs are fairly distinctive. You might have to shadow a little bit with your iris diaphragm in order to see them. But um, we didn't want to be able to see those. And then we'll talk about fungi. So there is the fungal hypha. And those are the traps that they put out. Um, you know, Lack of bacillus, you think? Another one, so a bunch of species. Let's go up to 400x total, man. There we are, uh, 400. The fungus actually grows that trap and it puts out exactly the same exudates as a root produces. So what is it? It's a trap. It um, puts these hyphae, put out exudates that are exactly the same as a root puts out. So who are they trying to lure to the trap? So these are really good guy nematode, excuse me, fungi. <laughs> so um, sooner or later, there's going to be a nematode that comes and puts its head or its tail through one of those traps. Water rushes into those cells. The cells swell up and trap down on the nematode. And the fungus slowly drills a hole through the cuticle of the nematode and then grows throughout that nematode and grows more fungi, puts out more traps. Cool. It's great when you think that it's going after your root feeding nematodes, and every root feeding nematode on the planet deserves to die. <laughs> so, this is some of the work by Nordgren Kurtz. She is the world's authority on nematode trapping fungi. This is a first scanning icon picture Nordgren Kurtz. <laughs> She's at the University of Helsinki in Finland, and uh, petri dish that she was growing the nematode trapping fungus on. So here you go, you got all the traps. Drop a few nematodes onto the slide, or see nematodes onto the slide. And you can see where the nematode put its head, its tail pierced on the rings. Those um, traps swell up as soon as you touch the inside surface of those traps, it causes water to rush in. So the nematode has this right now. Um, YouTube. YouTube this on uh, tonight when you're home and look at some of the pictures of nematodes and there's the traps, uh, the fungus, the nematode swimming around and then sticks its head through one of the traps and BAM! Got it! And now the nematode's there like, going, no! There are other ways to deal with root feeding nematodes. So there's a lot of fungi that when they contact the outside of the um, nematode, this is the nematode moving through the soil, that spore germinates, grows into the nematode, grows completely throughout there, and turns into spores. This nematode is still alive, it's still moving through the soil, and you can see that it's leaving behind spores of this particular fungus, it's called a chytrid. 
So little landmines are being left behind specific to routine nematodes. You can see that sphere. You can't quite see the knob right there because um, that spore is covering it. But this is for silicus, and uh, it's spreading. Poor little nematode is still moving. I don't know. What would that? Okay, don't think about it. <laughs> So, lots of different fungi, parasitic, you know, so, what kind of nematode is this? See any knobs? Yeah. See any spear? No. So what is it? My favorite. Be confident. Lots of other stuff in the soil, and I'm uh, going to just quickly go through some of this. So, um, high feet and roots, staying here, so we want to get going. Uh, this is pollen. Um, really, some really gorgeous stuff can be present in your soil. And, you know, I, you take pictures of this and then you try to figure out what it is. This is a fungus. You got to focus. Right, exactly. You got to focus. So, right here, it is in focus. You have to focus all the way along there. And yes, it is uniform diameter all the way along. What's the diameter on that fungus? Yeah, I would, you know, break us find your little bacteria. There we are. I would give it a um, 2 and a half, 3 color. Rounded. A real light tan color. So it's not a bad, bad fungus. It's not, not really bad at all. Um, is this fungal life on? Yes. Well, is it? It's not uniform diameter all the way along, so that, yeah, that's the spore, right? The spore from which you germinated. So keep going. Uh, Chlamydospores, Canidia, we've looked at all of that. Is that a fungus? about that identification. Is this a fungus? This is 400X. Find out, look where it is in focus. Actinobacteria. Very good, actinobacteria. Let's see how narrow it is. That's not a fungus. What's this cube here? 
And actually, what is that in my This is cellulose. When cellulose is heated and put under pressure, it forms these spirals. Sometimes you'll see this in plant material itself, but most of the time when you see these kinds of curls, you're looking at paper. This is probably from a compost where somebody put paper into the compost, and so you'll see that distinctive signal. It's not harmful in any way. You want some fungi to come in here and chew it up, but um, don't mistake that as being a fungus. Now we're talking about here? Of course, we don't have a mouse, so we're kind of stuck. That's stuff. We've recycled all the plates and things. Do they actually do this one out or the the um, cellulose plates? No, they're hopeless. Uh, most people in the compost industry don't like those. Uh, and they're supposedly um, compostable. No, not at all. All they've done is put a little bit of um, corn fiber in between the plastic fibers. Okay, so the corn fibers will decompose, but you still have the plastic in your um, compost pile and your soil, and that stuff's going to take a little longer to decompose. So, now you see that they do. What's this? That's the amoeba. You can see the amoeba right there. What's this? Silly cyst. It's just starting to round up. You know, about 50 seconds before I took this picture, it was actually a cilia. And then it just decided to go, and they round up really fast. You can still see some of the bacteria it was eating, but it will pretty soon, nice long round cyst like that. It will clear up. How about this? If you saw this in your compost, because these are all cilia. Just have a keen frenzy on some of your old fungi. You know, so it's not anaerobic, things are bad, and look out. So, yeah. scary. 200 at, or I'm using our 10x objective, and look at the size of that cilia. If you saw this thing at 400x, it'd be bigger than your field of view. Good way to scare you. As you're searching and you're going, Nematode, oh, Nematode, where are you? And all one of these things swims by. Whoa! Little scary. Use your forex objective for identifying uh, my garbage This is a simple finding. So, um, long antennae, multiple segments, a pair of legs per segment. Simple if there's no fungi present in your soil, it will turn around and eat your plants. Devastating in early vegetable, um, when you're dealing with seedlings of vegetables, you cannot allow your soil to get water blocked. Because then all your fungi die, and your sublimates are going to go looking for something to eat, and they won't eat your plants. If you've got plenty of fungi, your sublimates won't touch your plants. Are those visible with naked eye? Yes, they are, but they're really small. And people will often confuse these with the good guys. These are springtails. May, may I show you some? I think I have some of those on my complex right here. Like to get. Uh, maybe it is. Okay. okay, so I think that's the end. Oh, I want to I wanna get all of your. Um, I want to get all of your um, email addresses because I would like to send you all the um, there's a million other files on the computer that the banks. Um, I want to send you all the microscope worksheets.
remind yourself what this is. Or any notes that you have. All of the assessments are done at 400x total magnification, except for your nematodes, right? So when you go to the upper right hand corner, you're going to look at the first field and write in how many bacteria. Okay, but now you're going to look at your 1 to 5 dilution in the oven on how many bacteria to count. So we're going to wait on that. So we're going to go down here, and you notice that it says write in dilution used here. And so here as well in, as in X15. So when you start calculating, you'll notice that there's all these wonderful equations. And so X, you want to come down here and put the proper dilution factor that you actually use for your bacteria. The dilution factor you actually use to count your actinobacteria. The dilution that you count is your fungi. So remember to change these every time you actually write a sample in here. So um, come back here, and um, you know, your bacteria are going to count it later, but we will be counting your actinobacteria bacteria right now. And then start, you might write in your what kind of bacteria you have right here now. How many fungal strains did you see in this field? Diameter. And color. So I usually do like a 2.5 B for black or 2.5 DR for brown, 2.5 red, gold, tan. And you develop your own little shorthand for these colors. And then you go down the same field, you're writing how many flatulates, how many needy, how many ciliates. But you remember to write in your dilution that you're actually using and write it in right here, so like five. So you um, know what dilution you actually use to measure um, your flatulence maybe. Now nematodes, we may go we do this at the beginning. We don't use any dilution, we scan the whole slide. So um, typically the one to five dilution. So we're gonna scan the whole slide, so you still have to put your dilution in here, sorry. Um, so that goes in right there. So now you're done with your first field, you're going to go back and do your second field, and you're going to write in your actinobacteria in your second field, your fungi, the diameter and color, um, your flies, what's the that you see, ciliates that you see in there, um, and then your second field is done, and your third field. And and your fourth field, the fifth field, the sixth field, and you know, it's like when you get to your fifth field, take a look at how much variability there is. If you have no fungi, no fungi, no fungi, no fungi, no fungi, you might get the clue that you have no fungi. And you could really just stop there. And you know, you don't have any bacteria and actinos. You could just stop there. Or let's say you have five and six and four and five and six. Uh, I really don't think you have much variability in there. You don't have to worry about it. You could now go do your bacterial counts. Uh, you know, go to your next higher dilution, make your next higher dilution, make your next. And you write in the dilution that you're going to use. So 1 to 10,000. And I saw 10 bacteria, 12 bacteria, 15, 8, 11. Nice tight variation. You're probably done in five fields. But let's say you're writing in here um, 50, 10, 6, 92, 45. Ow, that's nasty variation. You may want to continue and do another few more fields. So you, you get a better representation of what the number actually is. Same thing with your fungi, if you find um, three fungal strands and then nothing, nothing, two, nothing, nothing. You probably want to you know, continue looking because you got too much variation. So it's up to you to decide how much variation is too nasty and how much is okay. So you fill in your um, sheet, you go over here, question? Yeah, how much variation is there? 
between one clump of your sample and another clump of your sample? Well, hopefully, um, you uh, are not counting clump of your sample. You're counting the field. So okay. you take it out of your little thing, and what's what's the variation between the, the test tube that you mixed up versus the next one that would be like a quarter of an inch of the Hopefully because our sample is taken from a number of different places, we're going to mix all of that together and we're going to even out that variability. We're mixing that sample together. So hopefully that gram that you're taking out is representative. You've got the things pretty well mixed in there. Now if you're concerned that, and I think there's some variability just within my sample, do more than one sample from the same area. You from the same bag, and you right at first it might be really useful for you to work on that. How much variation from sample one from this bag, from sample two from the bag, sample three from the bag? And what I see is typically, as long as you're being pretty good about mixing, and that's where you're not overfilling your bag, so you can actually mix your bag pretty easily. There's less variation from one sample of this to the next sample of this to the next sample of this than you have. So now, here we are out here at the, um, our, our organism number. So we filled in our dilution factor, whatever it is. Now we need to go here. And what it says is organisms per gram. Mean times the dilution times the fields times the number of drops. So we have a few things that we need to perhaps change here. What's in the equation right now is 1,600, and that's the number of fields at 400x if you're using an 18 by 18 millimeter cover slip. Well, what size is your cover slip? So we'll go back here to your cover slip, and this is a 22 by 22 millimeter. So what you're going to need to do is change that 1,600 to this, to 3,600, because that's how many fields are in a 22 by 22 millimeter cover set. So, go ahead and change that, and when you realize that you're always going to be using a 22 by 22 millimeter cover slip, just go in here, and in all of these equations, so there, there, and go down here, see the same thing, that needs to be changed. That's going to need to be changed and then, uh, all the way down because you're always going to use 22 by 22 millimeter. In parts of the world, they don't have 22 millimeter um, square cover slips, so I have to change it. Now, also note that there's this 20 here as well. When you're putting one drop on your slide, there are 20 drops in a millimeter. So this 20 is if you are putting one drop on your slide. But if you choose to put two drops on your slide, then you have to change that number to 10. So how many drops did you put on your slide? You may have to go and fix that in each one of your samples, in each one of your equations. So you get calculation correct. And then here, all we're doing is taking your numbers of organisms per field and converting it into biomass. So if you look at this, it's just Y8 multiplied by the weight of a single bacterium. A bacterium weighs two picograms. So we're multiplying by that weight so we can get biomass. And then there's our actinobacteria, and so we're going to be multiplying by uh, the biofilm of the typical actinobacterium. Um, so again, we're getting uh, micrograms of actinobacteria. Here's our micrograms of fungi, same kind of equation. Biovalume of our bio of our fungal fungi, and so we're getting biomass. We don't do biomass of protozoa, we're just going to be looking at numbers. 
So now when we get our micrograms of bacteria compared to our micrograms of fungi, we can do our follow the bacterial biomass ratio. So that's your, um, we, you know, we'll get the numbers of um, nematodes, and again, it you know depends on how many drops you put in your uh, microscope slide. So you may have to go and change that as appropriate. If you have any trouble with this um, understanding or remembering everything I just so quickly went over, um, go ahead and email, give me a call, Skype, whatever you need to um, help have me help you work through all of this data. And if I can have that sheet with the uh, email addresses, I'll go ahead and make sure that all of you get emailed with this particular um, I can only do a little bit at a time, okay, please? Sorry, sorry. So um, if you can, um, and let me just, for all of you, let me go ahead and change the um, 22 millimeter by 22 millimeter. I'm going to change that and put that in here as the correct thing, okay? That's so cool. I mean, like, to make that, it's like... Uh, it, you know, I've started that thing so many times, and I don't know how to deal with this. So, yeah, it took a while. Okay, so, where is the list of email addresses? Where is it coming from? You have it? Great. Oh, wait. Okay, I think we want to wander out and see what David's doing in the compost.